years, women and girls across Afghanistan have been murdered, shot dead on the street, bombed on their way to work, and on their way home from school. There has been so much blood, and there has been very little accountability. Being a professional woman is enough to get you killed. Attackers have been targeting women who dared to carve out a career, and a generation of girls who were promised freedoms their mothers never knew. With no one held accountable for many of the deadly attacks, the killings are a stark warning of what the future could hold. Now that the Taliban are back in control, 101 East investigates the fight for justice for Afghanistan's women. Most days, Rajab Ali Rezaei has come to this graveyard on the outskirts of the Afghan capital, Kabul. It's been a quiet refuge from the chaos of the city, but it offers him little peace. Saleha was 18, Zakia just 13. Both wanted to be doctors. I know that they had a lot of effort. 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 On a Saturday afternoon in May of this year, Saleha was waiting for her younger sister outside the gates of Sayed al Shahada High School. As girls spilled onto the streets, a car bomb exploded just a few meters away. Sadiqa Mahmoudi, a grade 11 student, had just walked out of the school gates. I'm walking out uh, with my classmates and bomb explodes. I give my hands in, in, in front of my face and close my eyes. When uh, I open my eyes, I can't believe it. Principal Akila Tavakoli ran to the front gate when she heard the blast. As neighbors rushed to help and girls fled in all directions, two more bombs exploded. Rajab heard the explosions from his home. In the rubble, Rajab found Saleha's backpack with her identity card inside. It was all he could find of his daughters. He rushed from hospital to hospital, frantically searching for them. Finally, his brother called him at one in the morning. A body that looked like Zakia's had been brought to a hospital a bit further away. <laughs>
When the final toll was counted, Rajab's daughters were among 85 killed, almost all of them young girls. Former President Ashraf Ghani condemned the violence. Hamla, bala in mardum beguna, bavija, kodakon, maselon, washagirdan makatib, misdaq barez jinayat bashari, wazid dar zeshay islami buda. Ghani blamed the Taliban, but they denied responsibility. Four months later, the family say no one has been held accountable for this mass killing. In Afghanistan, being female can be enough to get you killed. 390 girls and women were killed in the first six months of this year, the highest number ever recorded by the United Nations. Even before the fall of Kabul, it was often not clear who was to blame. The Taliban routinely denied the attacks, while ISIL claimed responsibility for some. Based on our investigation, there has been little justice for the murdered women. There has been so much, so much blood, and there has been very little accountability. We lost so many, so many of comrades. And the reality is a battlefield reality. They are coming with their guns. Before her office was overtaken by the Taliban, Shahrazad Akbar was the head of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. She fears as long as perpetrators are allowed to walk free, more women will become targets. When it comes to killings of women and assassinations of women, of course, lack of accountability then sends this message to women that they are completely unprotected. It just seemed uh, like being a professional woman was enough to get you killed. It wasn't meant to be like this. After the Taliban was ousted in 2001, a generation of women stepped out of the shadows and into public life, becoming police officers, soldiers, judges and politicians. Girls, forbidden under the old Taliban regime from attending school, flooded into classrooms. Sayyid al-Shahada High School has more than 7,500 female students. This made it a target. Bombers struck in the afternoon when only girls were in class. I wanted to get the students to get back to school. I wanted to get the students to get back to school. I wanted to get the students to get back to school in the next year. So we have a few buildings here. Yes. Which ones are for girls? We first visited the school in 2018. Even then, getting an education was tough for girls. She's saying that uh, uh, those uh, we are seeing the buildings, these are all the boys. All the buildings all are the for boys. All the boys, yes. Where are the girls? That's the school of the girls. <laughs> At the time, Principal Akila and one of her students showed me how only the boys had classrooms. The girls had to study outside on the ground, under the sun, and in the rain. But it didn't deter them. We don't have classroom to study. We don't have buildings as well. And that's just for girls. Uh, all of them, these buildings are from the boys, but we don't have any building. In July this year, just a few weeks before the Taliban seized Kabul, we returned to the school to catch up with the girls. I <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy I meet you look again. Look at you. How are you? I am fine. You look How great. Are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm great. You look great. <laughs> Thank you. Akila shows me how the girls now have their own classrooms. 
دخترا فقط برای دخترا مؤسسه گهواره مؤسسه گهواره 20 پایه کمتر برای مکتب آوردن but they've come too late for the dozens of girls who perished in the bombings و شاگردی که دست دادیم این امکانات بر ما مهیا شده و من این قسم نمی خواستم but the students remain determined encouraging each other to not give up Former student Aisha is no stranger to the violence that has devastated her old high school. Last year, she narrowly avoided a bombing that killed 19 students and staff at Kabul University. The enemies, they attack the school, they attack the mosque, they attack the car, they attack the road, they attack the university. There is, there is not any safe place. Many young women in Afghanistan have never experienced life under the Taliban. But there's clear evidence of the violence they're capable of. This video, published online in April, shows the Taliban whipping a woman in the province of Herat for allegedly having a romantic relationship. There are fears that scenes of violence like this could become more common under Taliban rule. For girls like Aisha, in the middle of their studies, the future is now uncertain. I think we're going to have a very really dark life again. The most important thing that I'm really worried about is not going to the university. I, I just want to be, uh, I just want to continue education. Taliban shocked the world when they took over Afghanistan with astonishing speed. U.S. intelligence had predicted it would take months, even years, before Kabul could fall. But in just 10 days, the Taliban overran the country's major cities with little resistance. Fighters flooded into the capital, entering the seat of power after the president fled. Just weeks before the takeover, we arranged an interview with the Taliban commander in Ghazni province, south of the capital. Sayyifullah Mohammadi denies the Taliban was responsible for the school bombings and other deadly attacks on women. He says under Taliban rule, women will be subject to Islamic law. He says Taliban leaders will decide where women can work and what jobs they can do. Despite assertions that women's rights will be respected, the Taliban have imposed more restrictions on women after they signed a peace deal with the U.S. in February 2020. In some areas outside the capital, girls have been stopped from going to school and women prohibited from leaving home without a male companion. Before the province of Gore was taken over, these women took up arms in a show of defiance. Twenty-four-year-old Fatima Khalil was also defiant. The human rights worker known as Natasha seized the opportunities denied to previous generations of Afghan women. 
Let's make sure the 1.1 billion girls that will go forward with our young generation change the fate of the world for the better. She spoke six languages and loved to dance. Impressed by her passion, Shahrazad hired her to work at the Human Rights Commission. She was very young, very ambitious, very talented. She's one of the best young Afghans that I have, uh, I have worked with. But less than a year into the job, attackers struck. It was a Saturday morning in June of 2020 when Fatima Natasha and her driver were on their way to work. They never made it to the office. The bomb exploded, killing them both. They had seen on the news that there had been an explosion, um, targeted killing. Um, and I got worried and I called colleagues. I was like, what's going on? They said Fatima is not picking up her phone. Natasha's older sister, Lima, lives in the U.S. After hearing the news that her sister had been killed, she took the first flight she could back to Kabul. Natasha disappeared from the surface of the world. People would tell me, Lima, Natasha is in a good place right now. For me, it was like, no, she wanted to live. She had so many dreams to live. Natasha was born in Pakistan, where her family sought refuge during the Taliban years. I have witnessed um, her coming to the world from the first day of that. And um, she was really a happy baby. She was this um, goofy young kid. The other day I was going through the photo albums. I couldn't find even a single photo of her not smiling. Between me and her, there was this big age difference. So for me, she was like my daughter. Fatima Natasha excelled at school after the family returned to Afghanistan. Hello, Fatima. Then she moved to Kyrgyzstan to attend the American University of Central Asia. Hi, my name is Fatima Khalid. I'm from anthropology department. This year, my main goal is to become a part of student senate. Her big dream was that she wanted to be the Secretary General of the UN someday. She says, like, I want to work for human rights. I wish I had not told her to come back to Afghanistan. There are so many I wish that I know it's so unrealistic to wish for. So there is always this guilt um, that I will live with. But Natasha knew the risks of going home. This video was filmed a year before she was killed. I guess for some reason, it's better like I should die in this heaven. After Natasha's death, her university created a scholarship for Afghan women in her name. And her family raised money for a school for disabled children honoring her work with some of the country's most vulnerable. But for Lima, an open wound remains. More than a year later, her sister's killer still walks free. We were told that Natasha was killed by one of the Taliban. We were given a name. This guy is in so-and-so province. And then the question was why you are not arresting him if he is like you know the location of this person. Um, there was no answer. We still are waiting that uh, who killed uh, my sister Natasha and, and why her death should go in vain. We have the rights to know who kills our children, right? For months, Lima sought answers from the authorities. When the government was still in power, we sent detailed questions to the Attorney General, the Kabul police, and the minister responsible for law enforcement. None of them replied to our requests for comment. Shahrzad also demanded answers. She called on the United Nations to investigate the targeted killings, which she says amount to war crimes. We don't have justice and this is not acceptable, this is not fair. And so something needs to move fast. Um, I don't know what everyone is waiting for, honestly. I honestly don't. This lack of accountability is a common grievance among those who have lost loved ones. <laughs> Journalist Malalai Maywand was murdered in December 2020 in the city of Jalalabad in eastern Afghanistan. 
Her brother Hamid says authorities told him two people were arrested two days after her death. But nine months later, he still doesn't know who killed his sister. Before the Taliban's return, we asked the local police, governor, and national authorities if anyone had been arrested in relation to Malalai's killing. We received no response. Malalai was a trailblazer, the first female TV anchor for her network and a women's rights activist. He, she said, stop this killing war, stop. Malalai knew the risks better than most, and she knew she was a target. After authorities warned her about a threat on her life, the family moved house and Malalai altered her schedule leaving for work at different times, taking different routes. But it wasn't enough. One morning last December, as she was leaving for the office, Hamid heard gunshots. The 25-year-old was killed instantly. Her driver also shot dead. Malalai had tried to prepare her brother for the worst. Shortly after Malalai was killed, three more young women who worked for the same TV network were shot dead. ISIL claimed responsibility, but there have been no reports of arrests. The head of the network told us he has stopped hiring women because he can't guarantee their safety. The Taliban continue to insist women are safe under their rule. But many are unconvinced and are trying to flee the country. Mahdiya Muhammad Ali, Jose Zahmiyomu, who was killed a few days after the attack. Those who survived the attacks want to honor the dead by making sure they did not die in vain. The soldiers have to be protected from them and to their goal is to get to the goal of their goal. They want to get to the goal. Principal Akila grieves the loss of dozens of her students. But she is adamant that girls should be able to continue their education. Her former student Aisha agrees. She's determined to put her education to good use. I don't want to leave Afghanistan because it's our country, my country, and um, I want to serve my people. I'm really worried. But no matter what, there is a lot of amazing Afghan girls and uh, they will talk tomorrow and uh, make this country a better place for the girls and for female. For many of those who remain, the return of the Taliban brings great uncertainty. They fear hard-won freedoms may now be under grave threat and there will be no justice for Afghanistan's women.